Praise the Lord. God is good. Yeah. Amen. It's good to be with the church family today. Amen. You know, we, we began um, last week uh, talking really about some tough things that Jesus said. How many of you know there's some tough things that Jesus said? You know, you try to reconcile that. And those of you that know, we're very much a family-oriented church. And so we're not talking against family. In fact, we want to support family. But we've also talked about the fact that we're a family of families. And what exactly does that mean? The fact that we're a church family. And, and, and sometimes, you know, it's like we, we live in a, in, in a day and an age where individualism is lifted up. That's part of a cultural uh, aspect that we have to deal with. Um, there's an entitlement generation. You know, everyone's entitled. And then we, we bring that into our theological understanding so that it's me and Jesus. Um, and, and we fail to really see um, what his call of discipleship really is. Because it's not just an isolated me and Jesus kind of thing. In fact, I was having a discussion with Lisa, who, who's working this weekend, but you know, she was having this discussion with some other ladies in another Bible study, a little bit about some of the concepts that we are talking about last week. And, and it, it was hard to put across, because people have an understanding. I said, you know, and I've taught this myself, you know, first is God, then it's your family, then it's the church. But that's a little backwards. And, and, and some of you may want to disagree with me, but when you really take a look at the scriptures, it is, you cannot separate God from your church family. Because to have a father is to have brothers and sisters. And I know in my own life there came a time, and, and I very much try to honor my parents and, and my siblings, but there came a time where I had to make a decision to follow the Lord. And to follow the Lord sometimes means doing something different than what your family expects you to do. How I many know what I'm talking about? You know, and, and I remember when we dedicated our first, now our second child, um, Andrea, um, you know, that created a rift in our family. The fact that we were dedicating her, not baptizing her. Because we were walking according to the knowledge of what we knew now and by faith. Um, and, and so we recognize that, yes, we do have a family, natural family. In fact, I think our natural family has benefited because we have been part of a church family. Because that, the, but the reality is this, is, and I talked last week about how there's a higher level of commitment that's necessary. You know, when, when Jesus said to follow me, people were saying, your mother and your brother's outside. And he said, who are? my mother and brothers and sisters but those that do the will of my father in heaven and so Jesus was saying Jesus was actually in that case distancing himself from his natural family in order to be able to point out the reality of a spiritual family you know, ideally it would be great that all of our natural families were part of our spiritual family amen but we know that's not always the case and, and we have to learn how, how to deal with that. Yeah, you know, I, I even recall when, when Jesus was 12 years old. And, and you know the story, he, you know, the mother and father left and he was still there among the teachers. The mother came and Mary come and, and she told Jesus, you know, you, you really had us worried. And what did he tell her then? He said, you should have known that I'd be about my father's business. And then the word God says he went with his mother and father and he was subjected to them. So it wasn't out of order, but even at 12 years old, he was pointing something out to his parents about his order of priority. We were talking about this and, and you know, I, I, I know that I'm going to fail to really have the time to even walk through what I want to do today. But today I want to look at how did Paul deal with this issue of family of families? You know that we, we look at Jesus and some of the hard sayings that he had and, and, and at the same time then we say well, well let's see did, did Paul sort of you know tone it down a bit when, when, when the churches were being built or can we glean something about what Paul said and um, I'm going to start with kind of a, an odd scripture this morning, but then I'll come back to it. 1 Corinthians 6, 6 says, The brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. A franchise speak in history with about $60 million plus spent 
strange section. We'll come back to the context of that. But there are some family words being used by Paul. And when we look at this, you know, this is one of the first surviving letters that Paul wrote. He wrote to the Corinthians. And actually he's rebuking the Corinthians. He's basing a rebuke here, or a challenge, based on the fact that they were quick to sue. They, there was this litigious uh, uh, behavior on the fact that he's saying, this is wrong because you are siblings in the faith. Brother Paul admonishes his readers here, don't sue one another. And we would see, obviously, in the context in the first eight verses of chapter 6. But the idea here is brothers would rather be wronged than do this in a public manner. And we'll return back to the Corinthians at first, but I want to back up a little bit. I want to capture a bigger picture of God's church as Paul envisioned, as, as we learn from the teachings of Paul, because we can see that there was constant relational struggles among the converts of Paul, and it gave the apostle ample opportunity to teach his readers how to live together in the community as God's chosen people. You know, the, the Bible does say that, Jesus said this, they will know you by the, the love that you have for each other. In other words, the demonstration of your witness to the world is not about words as much as it is about the context of how you live together as people of God. And, and so Paul often addressed interpersonal problems that were confronting his congregations by drawing on the image of the church as a family. And he desired his brothers and sisters in Christ to treat one another as a family. And, and he desired them to understand, and of course they had the model of the early Mediterranean family model, which really was a very unified uh, family model where, where it was a strong group mentality. And Paul's trying to pull from that idea, which we have no concept of today. Because it's like everybody sort of pulls for their own self. And, and that's not the kind of uh, culture which Paul was pulling from. And he was using the image of the family in his culture to be able to give a picture of the family of God. If we read the scriptures with our understanding of family, and we put our understanding of family into the scriptures, we miss the value of what he's saying. Just like Jesus, Paul viewed the family as a surrogate family, a family that was put together. In 13 of his epistles, he used family terminology often. The interesting thing is this, is before I tell you the, the quantity, some of the translations of your Bibles have omitted some of this family terminology to be gender neutral. But we fail to after see the impact of what it was saying. For instance, brothers or sisters, and when it speaks about brothers in the scriptures, it's speaking about brothers and sisters. It, it, it's both of them together, but the occurrences in his epistles alone is 139 times that he refers to brothers and sisters. Father is referred to 63 times. The idea of inheritance or inheriting something or being an heir 19 times and to child uh, uh, or son 17 times and child 9, 39 times. And the interesting thing is when you look at the frequency of these words when Paul used these terms, it almost always was in terms of the reflection of the church family. He wasn't just talking about your father or your mother. He was talking about mothers in Christ, fathers in Christ. You know, the, the idea that the church is a family. And in 1 Corinthians, the first three verses, the first three chapters, Paul repeatedly draws on the church family model as he addresses his readers. Let me just read a few select verses. For it has been reported, verse 11 of chapter 1, to me about you, my brothers, by members of Chloe's household, that there are quarrels among you. 
In verse 26, brothers, consider your calling. Not many are wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. In, in verse 1 of chapter 2, when I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. In, in chapter 3, verse 1, brothers, I, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. And as babes in Christ, you know, we, we had the uh, head of the, uh, the nomination of, I guess it's Assembly of God in Brazil that was here. I, I was impressed with the simplicity in which he addressed the, the, all of the pastors and, and, and district leaders that were here. And the one term that he kept using over and over and over again was brothers. Because when you call somebody your brother, you're saying you're, you're on the same plane, but you belong to the family. There's something important about this. This isn't a word that's just used arbitrarily. It's not a word that's used to just fill in a sentence like some people throw swear words. You know, the idea of calling somebody your brother meant something significant. It's reminding them of the relationship that you have. If I was to go to one of my brothers and say, brother, I, I'd be reminding him that we are related to one another. You know, when you deal with your children in your own family, when, when, when you're, one of them does something to the other, you're saying what? You don't act this way toward your brother or your sister. You're reminding them of sibling terminology. Or you might say, this is not the way that you respond to a mother or to a father. Right? You're, you're taking that terminology to make something of importance. And so Paul here is dealing with this and he's using this word brother, which I said is generic for brothers or sisters, in, in an expression that maybe for us that are familiar with the New Testament, we might not be understanding what he's doing here. We, we use it like it's a punctuation mark or or some kind of a side, but really there's some significant theological importance in how he's using that. We need to assign to Paul's sibling terminology the full weight that comes there. If we're going to realize that Paul right now is employing family language, it's important for us to see that as such. And Paul views the family or the church family as a metaphor, as an invaluable symbol that illustrates the practical way that is meant for us to live in community. I don't want us to miss this, that yeah, how important this idea is. You know, everyone needs significance, and we find that when we come to the Lord, but everyone also needs a place to belong. And we find that in God's family. When, when we give our life to the Lord and we are baptized, we are baptized into the family of God. We are baptized into Christ, I understand that, but we are also identified into his teachings and then we are welcomed into his family. It's not an independent sort of thing and, and it's important for us to understand this because, Jim, if I do this, what would I look like? Um, anyway, I'll try not to do that. Um, you know, it, it's important for us, as we begin to think about this, that if God's called us as a family, what's entailed here? Because even when Romans 12, 1 and 2 says for us to present ourselves, right? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable before God, which is our reasonable service of worship, to not any longer be conformed to this world, but to be transformed, right? By the renewing of the mind. So, so that we can understand what God's will for our life is. But how many know that the challenge of our life and the sanctification of our life is dependent upon us living in community? It's easy for you to get along with yourself when you're only by yourself. But as soon as another person's involved in your life, you can't just think about you. Is that right? You have to give up something for someone else. You have to change for someone else. You know, Andrew and Andrea and Mackenzie had their perfect little life together. And now we got Luke. And this 
six pound, you know, few day old baby is the boss. <laughs> right now he is. Right? Because everything's revolving around him. But as he grows up, he's going to understand he's not the boss. But he'll come to know that. Paul's writings uses family imagery in four broad ways. And, and I was hoping to get three of these down today. And I don't think I'm going to get maybe to two. I actually have four. But let me, let me at least say what these four are. And so you kind of give an idea of the direction I want to go in. Because all we're seeing is we're observing what Paul's saying about family. The first one is that there's an effective solidarity. And, and by that I mean there's an emotional bond that Paul experienced among brothers and sisters in God's family. How many know that there's an emotional bond that we have with each other? That, that when, we, when we come together in the family, when one person's hurting, we're hurting with that person. Amen? When another person's rejoicing, we're rejoicing with that person. When we haven't seen someone in a while, there, there's something that's longing. Are they okay? Yeah, I just want to see their face, you know. And, and we'll, we'll see how that is worked out in some of the scriptures. The second thing is that th there was a family unity. You know, there's an interpersonal harmony and an absence of discord that Paul expected brothers and sisters in God's family. In other words, if we're family, we got to act like family. we got to deal with some things. How many know that family is not always easy to live with? But there's ways in which we deal with that. Amen? And, and we should deal with that. The third thing is material solidarity. And that, that's just a fancy word for saying that we have to share things. This is not a, a, a good word for this day, is it? You know, the idea of sharing resources, Paul assumed would characterize relationships among brothers and sisters in God's family. When, when you have two children, you have to teach them to share, right? What happens in our society, though, it seems that young people grow up and they've got this idea that everything is for them. And that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 35 years old, it's still your parents are supposed to provide for you. I remember hearing stories from my grandfather about even when they were kids going to school, that if you were walking along the way and you saw like a piece of coal, picked it up, put it in the bag, and you brought it home and you contributed it to the family's coal pile because that's what you heated with. You know, everyone did something. I, I, when I visit in Africa, for instance, I'll see kids that maybe seven-year-old girl or, or, or maybe eight years old, I don't know, but, you know, pretty small, w with a whole bunch of sticks on top of their head carrying them, bringing it from one place to the other. I see young boys acting in the same manner. And ours are busy playing on Xboxes and other kinds of things. They grow up into be older people that plan Xboxes and other things. There's a material solidarity. If you're part of the family, you contribute. You come, somebody invites you for dinner, what is the first thing you say? What can I bring? How many of you thought about that coming to church this morning? You came to a family meeting. Did you prepare yourself to bring something? The fourth thing is a family loyalty. The undivided commitment to God's group. It was a mark of a value system of brothers and sisters in Christ's family. You know, we can begin to look through many different scriptures on these four areas. You know, so what we're saying is that there's an affectionate or effective solidarity. There's a love bond that, that we should experience. There's a unity that we've got to become of one mind and work through our difficulties in order for us to be unified. There's a sharing of resources so that the family, when someone's in need, that need is met. And there's also a loyalty that we've made a commitment to the people of God. And this would mark part of our value system. Let me just try and deal with this first area, this area of solidarity. 
uh, effect is solidarity. And you can see a number of passages that reveal that Paul and others in the church experience a great deal of affection and emotional bonding with their fellow Christians. You know, we, we can see that because Paul's saying that the church is this strong group family of siblings, and he expresses his emotion to the family attachment. Look, let me look at Thessalonians, for instance, 1 Thessalonians 2. Verse 17 to, to chapter 3, verse 8. Paul writes this. But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short, for a short time in presence, you, what happened while he's writing this letter is that they had begun preaching there, began forming a church, but because of hostilities had to be driven out quickly. And so Paul's really concerned about the well-being of this church. So, so he says, taken away from you for a short time in presence, but not in heart. Endeavoring more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. What's Paul saying here? He's saying here, I, I, you know, we, we were quickly taken away from you, but you're not out of our mind. You're not out of our heart. We're concerned for your well-being. There, there's something going on here. And even though we wanted to try to go back, we were hindered, we were buffeted. But, you know, our joy is to know that you're doing well. Or would like to know that you're doing well. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, what were they not any longer enduring? Wondering how the church in Thessalonica was doing. We thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before, when we were with you, that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, as you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to you to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might have been in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and brought us good news of your faith and love, that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith, for now we live. If you stand fast in the Lord. What Paul's showing here is that he had a, a great affection for the church community. Not only him, but the other leaders that were with him. They were in Thessalonica. Some things began to take place. They were pushed out. He's saying, look, we warned you. We let you know that part of the call that we have in our life is to go through very difficult times and circumstances. But we were worried that because we did go through these circumstances, that your faith somehow was shaken. So therefore, you know, we, 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 we stayed alone and sent Timothy so that he could get word and help to establish you. And, and now that he's come back, he's given us such a joyful heart knowing that you're standing fast so that our relationship is secure. Look at another one when Paul speaks of his emissary uh, Epaphroditus um, in Philippians 2 verse 25 and 28. He said, yet I consider it necessary to send to you, Paphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly that when you see him again you may rejoice and I might be less sorrowful. But Paul again is sharing this emotional aspect. You know, here's a worker that he worked with, uh, uh, one that struggled through, almost died, but he's sending them to the Philippians. Why is he sending to them? Because they're the ones that had given him in the first place. He wants to send him back so that they can rejoice to see him face to face to know that he's well. There, there's a, there's an emo this is part of the family. I mean, how, how many of you, you have somebody that's serving in the armed forces and, you know, and, and, and you're praying for them and communicating, but to see them again. 
you know, we, we have uh, CJ and, and Ashley, and, and they've been living down south. But every time they come back, it's a rejoicing time. But it'll be even more rejoicing in a few weeks because they're staying for good. Amen. Amen. You know, but, but, but there's, this, there, there's this longing that, you know, it's nice to see, you know, t today is my grandson's birthday, Pedro's birthday. But we're not able to be there with him in Florida. You know, it would have been a nice thing to do. And it's a, the heart longs to, for the day in which, you know, they'll come back in late June or, or, or July. But, but, but there's still, you know, is everything good? You know what I'm talking about? There, there's this kind of effect. Paul's dealing with the same thing here, you know, with, with the uh, Philippians. He, he Here's, here's uh, another scripture when, when he's talking about a, a co-labor. He's saying in, in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 12 and 13. Furthermore, I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. But I had no rest in my spirit because I didn't find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. In other words, he's saying, I got this great opportunity, but my brother wasn't there. I stopped in my tracks and went back to search for my brother because my brother was more important than what was going on here. It's important to notice that in each of these passages we find expressions of an emotional attachment and family terminology in the same context that it demonstrates for us that there's a relational solidarity that's reflected in these texts so that we might read them in light of this descent group family values. In other words, Paul is saying here, you had your family values in your natural family, but you've come into the church family, you, you come into God's family, and there should be also those kind of things. Here's the issue. Do we go to church to attend some kind of building and a program and leave? How many people do that every Sunday? Or Saturday, whatever they happen to do. Seeing this isn't what church really is. Church isn't a building. It's not a program. It's not something that we detach our emotional, relational boundaries. It's not someplace I go where nobody knows my name. I'm not saying that church is cheers either. We come to church, we come to church because we're, we're people. When, when you see people walk through the door, we're, we're encouraged to see the face. Amen? You know, you, you, if you came to this church, you, you may find it a little strange that people give you a hug. My, my God, you know, this is a crazy place. I'm English. I don't do hugs. <laughs> I'm not. I'm French, so we do hugs. But anyway, I, I'm just saying that, you know, we, we get that kind of thing. I remember when, when I went out with Bernice. Bernice's family was not a huggy kind of family. Wait, they still aren't huggy kind of family. My family's a huggy kind of family. So, you know, it's like, it must be culture shock for, for you when you, when you come in. But, you know, but, but in, the, in the church family, the idea is this, is that it's more than just putting in our time, isn't it? it it's about building relationships because we, we're going to live together. And we're going to work together. And it's going to shape us because we are different. Glory to God. We're different. But it really does require us to, to work together. Look at this passage in Galatians. Um, talk about, you know, what Paul is saying here in, in Galatians 4, verse 12 to 15. He says, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first, and my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. I mean, I don't know what kind of physical condition Paul was in when he's preaching the gospel to him. You know, this one of the letters that he writes, he says, I wrote this myself in big letters. I don't know if it was an eye condition. You know, it seems here that they says that you would even pull out your eyes. But it could have been something else. It could have been an expression that was being used. But he's saying here that you so much received me 
that you would have been willing to give of your own self so that I would be healed. There's, there's an effective move here. I don't even know I could get out to number two. That's okay. We're family. And, and, and we're going to keep growing. Amen? And we're going to keep coming. Amen? Okay, I got some amens. We're a family. But what does it mean to be a church family? Paul's addressing four things here. I've only touched on the first one, that there needs to be this effective solidarity because of the love bond between us. We continue. Because of the love bond between us, we work something out. Because of the love bond between us, the world can see there's something different. I don't just attend some place. I don't go someplace. You know, some pastors, you have to call them up. You say, is so-and-so attending the church? And they say, well, let me look it up on the rolls. They don't know who's attending their church. Just a big sea of faces. So if you attend here, I think that people know you by name. It's not about attending, though, is it? Because you can still come here for 10 years and never anyone know who you are because you never opened up your life to anyone. So, so the idea is here, I can't really love or be loved unless I open myself. It, it takes risks, doesn't it? To trust and walk through those things. Paul's lifting up four important things. One is family, effective solidarity. There's a love bond. Remember David and Jonathan? You know, there was a love bond between the two of them. I mean, they hoped against hope. Here's Jonathan saying, David, I'll give you my sword. David, I'll give you my shield. David, I'll give you whatever I have. I'll, I'll be right there, number two, right behind you. Talk about hoping against hope. He was the king's son. The king's son doesn't become the servant of another king unless he dies. Jonathan yet saying, I love Bond. I'm, I'm going to be there for you. I'm, I'm going to continue. I'm making a, a commitment to you. You know, what, what does it take for us to walk together? Because the other aspects that I'm going to talk about, whether it's family unity, where, whether it's the sharing of our resources, where, whether it, it goes on beyond that place to... Um, the commitment level. It, it all begins here. It, it begins here by caring, by, by trusting, by knowing that, that God has placed us not for ourselves as individuals. It's not about me and Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. You don't come to the Lord through the group. We come to the Lord one by one. We, we come to the Lord individually. But once we come to the Lord, we don't come to the Lord to live an independent life. You can't view what Paul's saying in the scripture to your own experience. It's interesting, one of the, one of the passages that we'll look at, who knows how many weeks from now now. But, you know, my book tells me, I think it's actually in 1 Corinthians 7, the title of it says Principles of Marriage. In my, in my Bible. I don't know what your Bible says. The interesting thing is, it's not really about the principles of marriage at all. It's about the principles of relating to God's family and, and how our marriage relationship shouldn't hinder that. If you really read that, and maybe that's a good homework assignment, but read that because it says if you're single, the goal isn't married, the goal is following the Lord. If your marriage is struggling, the, the, you know, the, the idea is it's not so much divorce or, or, or marriage or not marriage, it's about using your life in a way to be able to minister to the Lord and do the work. And, and that's why Paul says, some of you, you'd be better off not, not trying to get married. In fact, if you get married, it's maybe even change your focus. Now, marriage isn't a bad thing. It's going to be 37 years for me and my wife this year. That's a good thing. 
But if my marriage was first before my commitment to the Lord and His work, it wouldn't be as satisfying as it is. We're a family of families. It's, uh, I, what I'm trying to say is we're not adding cinnamon to the, uh, our family. So okay, I have a family, and so therefore every now and then when, when this net breaks down, I have another net. No, I'm actually saying here's your first net, is your family of families. Because, you know, when, when, when our extended family isn't walking with the Lord, but, but our church family is, we have the encouragement that we need to stay serving the Lord. Amen? And so we need to put some proper things in, in priority. And I trust that you'll be patient with me to get through uh, this in the next several weeks. So, Lord, we just come before you, and we thank you, Lord. Father, there, there, there were some things that Jesus said that were, yes, they're tough to, to, to try to put together. But at the same time, it's really not that tough. If, if we can really understand that maybe we've looked at things a little bit backwards. And what we want to do is begin to look at your word in the way that it's been presented to us. Thank you, Lord, for your word in our life. Thank you, Lord that you don't leave us alone, you don't leave us orphans, you, you place us within a home, within a family. And Lord, as we begin to look at the scriptures, may we see the context of these verses in the light of family language that will help us to be the family of God you've called us to be. Lord, for those that have come in today, and I don't know what their particular need might be, but you do. And, and, and it's we do care. But Lord, we present everyone today before you. But as a family, encourage us, Lord, in, in the way that we need to walk. Help, help us as we help each other to really learn what it means to love each other. And at the same time, may it challenge our thinking and our behaving so that we might be wholly acceptable before you. And to be a great example to those around us. So we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.